Hello. Hello, everyone. Glad to see you. Um, thanks for joining me today for Domestica Crafty Tuesdays. Um, yeah, leave some comments so I can know that you're here and if you have any questions. Uh, we're going to show you something a little different from my course on Domestica, but it is still paper mache e. And um, yeah, it's going to be fun. We won't paper mache today because it's a little messy um, and it takes a little bit long to do the whole process at one time, but I'm going to show you something a little different. So if you've taken my course, this will be something that you can use to sort of expand upon, or if you haven't taken my course, maybe you will be intrigued to sign up for my course on Domestica. Um, hello. <laughs> I see somebody sneaking in while they're at work. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Don't get in trouble. Um, if you have taken my course, maybe you've seen this. This is one of my faves. She's a sneaky, fancy little cat dreaming of roller skating. Um, so many of you have made amazing projects in my Domestica course. It is so fun to see, check in and see when you post your projects. And even, I think I've, um, hi Heather. <laughs> Hello everybody. I, it's, love to, it's lovely to check in to see um, your process photos. So if you're in the course and you're taking photos or you're not taking photos, maybe do. I love seeing how you go through your process and it's fun to see it posted too. Um, I know it doesn't always occur to us to take pictures while we're actually making something, especially something messy like paper mache. But if you happen to take those pictures, definitely post them in the community. They're fun to see and I think they help other 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 people who are making the art to see how different people approach it because everybody's using slightly different materials just based on where you live or what you have on hand so it's cool to see you solve problems yeah hello thank you thanks for the kind words um i love this guy too mainly those socks <laughs> So these, this is an example, these two are examples of things that are from my Domestica course. Um, they're flat wall pieces that are paper mache Um, They're not super flat. I mean, they're a little bit dimensional, but when they have a little shadow box inside. But today we are going to, um, I'm gonna show you how to make something just a little more dimensional. Um, a lot of folks commented who have taken the course have commented that they really like these things that were on the little set, these little statues. These are things that I make a lot of. Oh, her arm is a little funky. Um, <laughs> so they're really simple and I'll just show you how to make these today because if you already know how to paper mache from the course or just in general, It'll be, it'll be easy to make these once you learn how to make the armature, which is the underlying structure. So in, in the course, we use cardboard or the foam core board as our main armature framework. So it's very, um, I would say, very, it's very like graphic, like there's a real specific shape that you're making and it's very sharp and flat. But with these, you can be a little more lumpy or rounded, <laughs> lumpy and rounded. That's what I would describe it as. Um, but the same technique that I'm teaching you today to make these little, little dudes um, is the same way that I make birds. So this is a little cardinal that I have that's a state bird of Virginia and many other states. Um, so you can, you can make a lot of things with the technique I'm going to teach today. So Let's see, just checking. Okay, so I think we'll get started. All right, 
So I, um, what I'm going to do is show you how, and you can see this is my little work surface here, and I have some little friends sprinkled around so you can, you know, see them. <laughs> I don't know. I think they're pretty cute. And here's what I'm going to do. Okay. So I have my supplies. The main supplies you need uh, are foil, aluminum foil, masking tape, hot glue, right here, uh, hot glue, masking tape, scissors, and if you want a little person with legs or a little creature with legs, you'll need some sticks. So I always have little dowels around because that's just something I have because of how much paper mache I do. But if you don't have dowels, if you just have some chopsticks that are not used, you know, that you get maybe with your takeout or something, you can use those too. So you can be inventive about what kind of sticks. You could get sticks outside, you know, from a tree <laughs> or the ground if you are not exactly um, a collector of weird dowels and sticks and things like that. So anyways, lots of, lots of options. But foil is the most important thing here for, and you'll probably hear my cat. He's crying for some reason. He doesn't like that I'm talking on camera. But anyway, it's too bad. All right, so this is foil. And the thing I love about foil is how very um, easy it is to crumple and shape. So, you know, when you're making small things, foil is so good. And it's really great for kids, too. I've noticed that, um, you know, children sometimes, they just need it to be really that's the word I'm looking for, obvious what they're doing. So if they sculpt foil, they can kind of see the shape of the thing that they're making. So to make something like this, I just take some foil um, and I crumple it. Now I don't crumple it super duper duper hard because you really want to have um, a little bit of room to play with with how much you can squish it down further, you might want to. I make really simple characters, but you can, you know, go really more complicated if you want to have something to have shape. Um, I'm looking at this, and this is this is the body. I usually do the body first, and then add a head. So I'm looking at this, and I kind of see like a little bumblebee. And so here's my little shape of the body, and that's it's that simple. You take a piece of foil. You crumple it and then set it to the side. Now, if you are um, doing something bigger, foil doesn't always make sense just because it's it can get a little bit heavy. It can get a little expensive. I use crumpled paper a lot for this. But for small sculptures and little ornaments, it's nice to use foil because you have a lot of control. OK, so I have my bee head. And now I'm going to, I mean, my bee body. Now I'm going to make my head. I do them separately so I have the most control. If I use one piece of foil for the head and the body, I just feel like I don't get enough control over what I'm doing. So I just hold these things up to each other. It kind of looks like a lady, but I definitely, this is way, sorry, it's hard to work and talk at the same time, but what I like to do is, hold things up to each other as I'm making them to see if they, you know, they look good together. So like if the head is too big, usually I make the head too small and I have to add foil. So, and then sometimes I'll be like, oh, maybe I'll turn it around like this. You know, I find this way of making paper mache sculptures to be a little more intuitive. So if you make something like this in my course, you'll know that there's a ton of planning when it comes to um, making your making your sculpture and like making sure that it's all planned out beforehand. But with these, if you're just like, oh, I want to make a little something fun, you can do these without planning. So if you're if you don't want to plan that much, this is a great way to go. Okay. So once I like the way this is looking, you can always make a little flat area if you want to glue things. Um, sometimes I like 
push it on the table to make a flat area. So I have my head and my body. I'm gonna put a little bit of hot glue. Ooh, I'll put it in there. Something to know about working with foil and hot glue is that the hot glue will really heat the foil up. So be careful that your fingers don't get too steamed. Okay, and then I just hold it like that. Okay. Let's see, and I let it dry for a little bit. And you get these little threads, just let it dry and you can break them off easily. But this is, this is just how I do little sculptures like this. For something like this, I will also use foil, but sometimes I use paper to crumple instead. And that is a little bit more difficult for just starting out because you are having to really learn how to crumple and tape it in a way so that it makes the shape. But with foil, you can just make the shape with foil. It stays where it is and then you tape it. And I'll show you that in just a minute. So this is my bumblebee. So I just didn't plan this one out. So this is kind of fun to, to show you how you can just do this. Ooh, everything has hot glue on it. How you can just do this and it's, it's pretty simple and fun and you always end up with something really cute. So um, another thing that a bee might need is some wings and you can use foil for this too. So I'll just crumple it first. I like to crumple my foil even for something small or flat-ish because you need it to have a little bit of structure and crumpling it gives it a little bit of structure. So. This, these are, will be my wings, both of my wings. So I'm kind of making an oval. This is how I want them to be shaped. Um, there's no real rules for this, so it's whatever you like. That's strong enough for me to tape. If it's just a single layer of uh, foil with no crumples, it, it'll just be too weak. So that's why I crumple it a little bit. There's nothing more to it than that. Just crumple it for a little bit of strength. Um, you're into symmetry you can work really hard to make these look completely perfect but I don't always do that okay so here are my wings here's my bee I'm going to put some hot glue here and glue them down and you can see that pretty quickly I've built up a little sculpture And that could be anything. It could be a bee, it could be a little fairy, a little angel, whatever you, whatever you want. Okay. So once you have this much done, um, these are very simple. I mean, this one is just a blob body with a head and a little bun on the top. And this one is the same thing, except for some ears. So I keep them pretty simple small things for paper mache small things um, can be a little tricky to paper mache it just takes a little longer and a little bit more patience so i try to keep things very simple all right and then once you have your little armature no legs yet <laughs> thank you heather for saying it's cute already hope other people are following along and making their own little cute things i just take some masking tape and start wrapping it around my armature. The reason I do this is, especially for things with foil, aluminum foil, is the paper mache doesn't really like to stick to it very well. And it's harder to get it on there. You can do it, but I, I like using the tape. I think it helps add some strength to the structure and some smoothness. So I just like to keep it like this. And then I also find that if you're new to paper mache and you don't have some tape on your armature, especially foil or plastic or something, you will get frustrated if your paper mache doesn't stick down right away. 
Um, so just make it easy on yourself. And use tape. Okay. It's kind of funny to watch somebody tape something, but I guess that's what we're doing. Just going to tape, tape, tape. And you really want to press your tape down so that it adheres to all of the details and curves that you've made on your armature. So you don't want it to really obscure any of that. So just kind of pinching it and smooshing it down helps. Okay, so just keep doing that. I hope if you make anything like this that you will post it on Instagram and tag me and Domestica because we would love to see that. Love seeing what people make. I mean, really, that's the point of teaching classes is sharing, you know, everybody who teaches on Domestica has like a specific skill set that they that they've developed and that they love and they feel passionate about. And um, for me, that's paper mache. And so when people share things that they've learned in our courses, it, it's so satisfying. It is fun. I mean, it really makes it all worth it to see what people make. And I, I've seen so many cool projects on Instagram and in the Domestica community for our class that I'm blown away. I mean, they are so amazing. And people are so creative and bringing their own stories into their sculptures. It's great. So please, please share. When people say share it, I really think they mean it. I mean, I know I do, but sometimes, you know, you're like, do you really care? But yes, people really do, especially teachers or people who are sharing their, their passions and skills. Okay. So you can see I had to squish it down a little more. But that looks pretty good. If you have a little spot like that that's not covered, it's okay. I'm going to cover it because I saw it, but, you know, it's no big deal. Just want most of it to be covered. This also helps keep it together while you're paper macheing it. It gets really wet when you're using the paste and strips of paper, so having this tape on here helps. If you see anything that's too lumpy for you, like I don't mind that too much, but if it's too lumpy, you can just press it. That's why I don't crumple the foil super tight to begin with, because I like to have a little workability there. Okay, so there's your armature. It's pretty cute, um, but I think I want mine to have legs. I'm gonna show you how to do those. I want to talk about, um, these little stands. Okay, um, I'm not going to do this on camera, but basically if you want your sculpture to have a little stand, you'll need a piece of wood. So these round ones are things you can buy at a craft store. I mean, you could also get a saw and make a bunch of these with a, a large stick <laughs> or small log. Uh, but you can also, I don't always glue them in, but so I'm taking it out here to show you. You can get these at the craft store or you can get, um, if you have just wood blocks, these, these are blocks that I got at the thrift store um, and they work great too. You can find pieces of wood anywhere or just cut your own. I just take a drill and drill two holes. And what I do here, this is, these are super skinny holes. So I used a smaller bit for these. Obviously I would use a larger drill bit that's just what you do and you'll want to go down like about a quarter of an inch or however much your piece of wood will let you so that's how we get things into a stand um, it's pretty simple and it looks cute but if you don't want to go to that trouble you can put legs on something and just then lean it against something you don't have to you don't have to put it in a stand it's really whatever you want to do okay so how am I going to get those legs in there? I'm going to use my scissors and poke a hole <laughs> very safely. No, it is pretty safe. So the, the scissors go into the foil really easily and the tape is pretty thin. So I just sort of carefully bore a hole in for each leg. And then I put hot glue in those holes just a little bit. 
and then you can put the legs in. Now the legs do not need to be the final size once you put them in there. If they, if these are a little tall, I would not make a bee have really long legs like this. Um, but I like to be able to have a little extra in case I do decide to put them in a block. Then I like to be able to play with how, how far in I want them to go or just be able to see how they look once they're in and then trim them. And the way I trim them is with um, heavy duty wire cutter. I'm gonna trim them now because I'm not putting them in a block. Just wanna have sort of semi-short little legs. There we go. Be careful for of flying wood pieces while you're doing that. All right, that's how I do it. Um, you can put antenna in here if you have a little piece of wire, you can do that. Let's see, I don't have a piece of wire near me, even though I think I said to have one. But little pieces of wire, um, you could glue a bead on. Paper mache, it, it's interesting. Um, I think I think that's all I have to show you right this minute so I can like maybe talk to you full, full on and in the face here, <laughs> okay? But what, the thing that I think is, is interesting about paper mache is that you can make it up as you go along. So yes, you can make projects like this that are really designy and um, more planned out, but you can also just take a bunch of stuff that you have around the house. Most people have foil and tape and um, maybe some chopsticks. Hello from Ukraine, hello. Um, Thanks for joining. Anyways, you can just you can just do this. I'm sorry, I'm reading questions. <laughs> can you make a paper mache stand? Weight it inside with rocks. Yeah, of course you could do that. You could maybe get a rock um, and maybe wrap some foil or some crumpled paper around it and paper mache. Um, the only thing that I I like wood or something like that because you can really get a nice hole drilled into it. So like if you had something that you made, you would want to make sure that it was thick and had many, many layers and that you could really get the legs in there so it would be stable. So something to experiment with. And like I was saying, you can you can experiment with materials that you have even even if, if it doesn't work, you've tried it and you found out if it worked, yes, that's great. And if it didn't, then you just try again. And that's the wonderful thing about paper mache is that there aren't really any hard and fast rules of how to make something. So um, you can pretty much cover anything with paper mache. Like I made these little funny flat um, articulated dolls using these decorative brad things, but I just cut this these shapes out of cardboard and then covered them with paper mache. So these are flat too, kind of like the project from the course, but they have a little fun thing that you can do, move their arms and legs and a nice surface to paint on. And let's see, oh, here's something. This is a really cute, well, I think it's cute. It's a cute little bird that I made for my paper mache book that came out in March. And this is made out of crumpled paper, some cardboard, some wire. Um, I think the nose is made out of foil. Um, yeah, you just start playing with the materials. And thanks, I like the orange kitty too, Debbie. Yeah, just start playing with the materials and you will start to think about, you know, ooh, what can I make with this? Or how can I make oh what's something you people love to make a lot of my students love to make their pets so if you are really into your cat or your dog um, you could totally make one out of paper mache either flat or dimensional in the dimensional way you could make a little ornament with some foil and just be like oh here's my dog i'm gonna have all my christmas tree full of ornaments of my dog okay here's another one that i made ahead of time. Um, I think it's a little bare because of the ears and that's just wanted to show you how you can make smaller pieces. So I have the body, it's just a little lump. And I'm, oops, I'm off camera here, hot gluing, sorry about that. And I think I have the head like this. 
So I'm just gonna hold it real quick. The glue is not as important as the tape. I, I do like the glue because it holds it in place for you instead of you having to juggle pieces. But um, yeah, using the tape is very important. So don't just glue, use tape. All right, so that's drying a little bit and I have these little ears that I've sort of flattened on the table. And I'm gonna glue them on here. So we have, I'll just put a blob of glue for both. And then just stick them on there. And, um, you know, it looks kind of cute immediately. I think of it as a little bear, but if you like to make girls with buns, this, that could be a girl with buns. And um, yeah, that's how simple it is. If you wanted to do something like um, put a pointy nose on there, or a, I guess bears have little snouts, you just take a little piece of foil and you might notice that I'm tearing certain pieces of foil, like I know exactly what size to use. I do know what size to use generally of pieces of foil, but sometimes when that's just because I do it a lot. But if you're not, if you're not, well, if you're new to paper mache and using foil, then you might just have to experiment. So if you crumple it up and it's way too big for an ear or a head, you can open it back up tear a little bit of piece of off and then crumple it back up again and try it. So that's what I would recommend. There's no real formula. Like I said, there's no real rules for paper mache. There, people do it in many, many, many different ways. And I'm gonna just make that flat again. And that's gonna be a cute little bear, bear nose. So, um, so yeah, experimentation with materials, you can, try things out and see what works for you. That's pretty cute. I think that's pretty cute. What do you think? I like that. Now the head is a little wonky in the back. I might have to smush it. I don't know. What do you think? I think that's pretty cute. I like it. Okay. Um, just as another example of things you can use to make paper mache, I have in my course, you might've seen this on the side. I've got a little pencil cup, this guy, and that's from my book. It's, it's like the, the chapter about making planters or I use, I kill all plants so I can not have a planter. I can only have a pencil cup. So, um, that's what I use this for. And the inside of this is, um, a plastic container that I've recycled. You can kind of see down in there, um, and covered with paper mache on the outside. And you could put a plant in there uh, or any little thing, but I use it for, for pencils because like I said, I have a black thumb and kill everything that I am given. So anyways, just different things. You can use a plastic bottle to make something like I did with my planter. I just cut off the top. Mm, can you use glue tack instead of hot glue? Geeky Ghost asks. Ge geeky Ghost. Okay, um, I've never used it before, but maybe. Um, I feel like blue tack is a precious commodity. <laughs> like I really love blue tack for what you know for what it's for. But you can probably use it. It's I don't know. Try it. I'm never going to say yes or no to that because I've never used it before, but try it and see what you think. If it holds it in place while you get the tape on, then you're good. If it doesn't or you feel like it's just too sticky, squishy, and annoying, then you might not want to use it. But try it. Try it, try it, try it. Okay, somebody says, that bear is so cute. Thank you, Heather. Do you have any tips for taping around the small parts like the ears and nose? I do. I do have tips for that. So the larger parts, it's pretty simple. You're just going to take your tape and go around. But when you're doing small little bits, I just tape, take my tape and tear it smaller, thinner. Sometimes you just need it to be thinner 
and sometimes you need like little tiny pieces, but I do like to wrap things. So even with the ear, you know, my tape is a little wide for just wrapping around. So tearing it down the middle to make it skinnier or to go over like this works great. So, and that's, that's true to um, Heather and everyone else. When you're paper macheing, uh, the general rule is the larger the sculpture, the bigger pieces of paper that you're going to want to put on with the paste. And then the smaller the sculpture, the smaller the pieces of paper. So if you are using a big piece of paper with your paper mache on a small thing and it's just kind of not working, try tearing it down a little bit and see if it works there. And that, that really applies to things like this tape is sticking in my fingers. That applies to things like this too, this, this beak and these little feet. You know, these, these probably needed little smaller bits. I mean, I'm sure they did. I use smaller pieces here than I would across the whole body. And um, true also for, I think I say this in the course, true for the little uh, hidden dream in the heart. Uh, this is just a piece of cardboard that I cut out and then I paper mache it, but because it's so small, you want little pieces. So smaller pieces of tape and smaller pieces of paper for paper mache. And I just keep going until I'm done. Oh, I did want to talk about my arms for these guys. So these arms are um, pipe cleaners. I don't know why I just blanked out on what those are called pipe cleaners. And uh, sometimes, you know, you can get them in all different colors, but sometimes you can paint them too. Uh, this one I painted to match his little thing. But what I do, I'm not going to do it right now because I like to do it when they're done, paper, being paper mache. I like to take something really sharp like this, or even better is an awl, you know, something that you would used in bookbinding or something like that. Here, I have one right here. And all like this. And you can just poke it all the way through the body like that. You can see it would go all the way through. And then once you have that in there, you can kind of turn it around and wiggle it and go back through the other side just to make it big enough. And then I just put the um, pipe cleaner all the way through make it even and then trim it if I need to. And sometimes, sometimes it's a really good fit and it doesn't move around without glue, but sometimes you need to just put a little bit of glue in there or on either side of the arms, like in the armpits to keep it stuck there. So that's how I do the arms. I like it because they're poseable. So paper mache, the one thing about it is that you can't really move it once it's done. So when you have a little sculpture like this and you want it to be doing something, having these little pipe cleaner arms, like this little lady is holding some cute flowers, I can just wrap her little arm hand around these flowers and then she can hold something. So I, I love to do that for these little sculptures. It's real easy. So what else? Does anybody have any other questions? Is, is anybody going to make one of these based on these instructions today? I would love to know if you're inspired to make something. What do you think? Oh, what kind of paint do I use? All right, good question. I love to use acrylic paint for my sculptures. I think it helps seal uh, the paper mache even more. So I'll usually paint it white or use gesso. And then I will go over with acrylic paint. Any kind of acrylic paint is great. I mean, I use lots of different kinds. I use acrylic gouache. I use regular acrylic paint. Um, what I've been loving lately is, just because it's so, it has such good pigment, is the golden so flat acrylic. So they're very flat and matte, which I like. Um, but they also are very vibrant in their acrylic. So they're sturdy. Sometimes acrylic gouache isn't quite as sturdy as I want it to be for paper mache. And this, this is great. I highly recommend this paint. I've been using it since I got it and I love it, but you can also just use craft acrylics too. Like the kind you get at the craft store. I love those. They come in so many colors that, you know, 
and they're inexpensive, so you can just get all the colors, which I love too. Um, yeah, any kind of acrylic. I know people use tempera paint, like in school, but I think for if you make a sculpture that you want to last for a while, I think I think it's best to use acrylic. And you can seal it if you want to with like a clear sealant, glossy or matte, if you like, um, but you don't have to. So I hope that answered the question. Do I paint directly on the masking tape? Good question. No. So what we're doing is making the framework for a paper mache thing. So this is just the underlying structure. And what happens is you, the paper mache is in three parts. So there's the making the armature. And then you cover it with paper mache. And if you've never done paper mache, it's torn up strips of paper that you dip into paste that you make like, um, flour and water, and then you smooth it on here to make a hard shell. And I think I have an example that I can show you that's paper mache and not yet painted. Let's see, sorry, I'm jiggling you a little bit. Sorry about that. You're on my table. Um, yeah, here's one. I think it's a bird. Yeah. So once you're done with this part, like this armature, you cover it with here, this one's covered with newspaper and it's pretty crunchy. Um, you dip it in this paste that we make, which you can learn about this in my Domestica course. Um, can't do the whole thing today. But anyways, so the armature, then the dipping these torn pieces of newspaper in a paste, cover the whole thing, and then you let it dry. And then after that, that's when you paint. Okay, so it's really, really strong once you paper mache. And um, somebody's asking, what stage do you add the arms? It's Kiara, good question. Um, I do it after I paper mache it. So we would have this whole thing paper mache, but not yet painted. And well, you can also paint it first, but I do it after it's paper mache because it's so strong, you can just kind of poke through with this. And um, I don't like to get these arms paper mache E because they remain soft since they're just pipe cleaners. So I like to do it afterwards. Ooh, she's making muscles. Um, I like to do it afterwards so that they can stay pretty soft. Is that good? Okay. All right. Let's see. Any other questions? I would love some more questions. Do you use a base paint before paint? Great question. Sometimes I use gesso, which prepares your surface for of your canvas or whatever you're painting. It's usually, you can get black, clear, or white. I usually use white. And um, I just do one thin coat of it so that I can have a nice prepared surface. And then I will paint on top of that. Now, you don't have to do that. Like if you use a newspaper and you really like the look of your paper mache with um, the printed printed newspaper you can paint on top of that and maybe your paint will be a little bit transparent and you can still see some of the the printed stuff on your newspaper so you can do that if you want to no no real rules as i keep saying you can do it any way you want um, i like to use base coat because i think it helps it last longer how do I make the glue? Okay, well, um, that's probably a whole other topic. But let me just say, Paula, um, the way that you can make paper mache paste is or glue. There are a lot of different ways. And so if you want to make a really simple one, I just use a whisk and a bowl. And then I put flour and water together and mix it until it's a smooth, um, I say it's like a pancake batter type of consistency. And that you can use as paste. If you want to see other recipes, look online, just Google paper mache paste recipe, and you will find lots of different versions of paper mache paste. Um, when I say there are no rules for paper mache, I mean, it's pretty much the Wild West. You can just 
make it up as you go or piece it together from what you've learned online or from different courses. These are the way that I'm talking about it. I will say it's my way of doing it, but I would never say it's the only way of doing it because paper mache has been around forever and different folks and different places make different paste in different ways. But flour and water is a pretty traditional way. Some people like to add salt because they think it helps with um, mold growth, but mainly you just want to make sure it dries pretty quickly. Okay. How many layers of paper is best suited for these small characters? Great question. At least one, two to three will make it look even better. So your first layer of paper mache, it just covers the whole thing and it's kind of like the skin that holds it all together. But um, as you add more layers of paper mache, the details start to sort of get softer on, and this is true of any, any size sculpture. The more layers you do, the softer it looks and it, it goes from looking like something that's a little <laughs> funky like this to getting smoother and rounder. And as I like to say, it takes on a life of its own. So um, my preference for little things like this is two layers, but at least one. Like when you're working with kids, I will say a lot of younger children cannot deal with more than one layer. Like when they're done with one layer, they're like, okay, I'm done. But if you're just an adult doing this for yourself and having fun, go ahead and put in the time and do two to three layers. You'll, you'll see as you work, that it starts to look a little different and more wonderful. So that's my recommendation. Do we use hot water for the paper? Um, I'm thinking you're asking about the paste, like hot water for the paste. I don't, I just use cold water and, and flour. I also use another recipe that is a cooked paste using cornstarch and that, that is, does use hot water, but a heat on the stove. But um, you can find those recipes online too. I like to use the flour and the water a lot because it is so easy, it's so quick, and you never have to stop what you're doing and cook something and sometimes you burn it, I don't know. It's just easier to do flour and water. And that's what I use a lot with my students because you can just mix it up and you don't need a, a stove or anything. So hopefully that answered your question, I'm not sure. Ooh, good question. Do I let it dry between layers? I do not. Okay. I've read different things in different places for years that say you, you need to let it dry between layers or you don't need to let it dry between layers. My discovery from just doing this is if you're in a hurry or taking a class or teaching a class or you just want to get something done quickly, you can you don't have to let it dry at all between layers. The only benefit that I really see is sometimes if you have like little tricky details, if you paper mache those first, like do one little layer over everything and then let it dry, it's easier to work on the details again with another layer after it's dry, but it's not necessary and I don't usually do it. Um, I don't think there's any, I guess, I, okay, I guess the other, it's probably too much information, but I guess the other reason people let it dry between layers is if you live in a really humid climate and you don't have a way to dry it, like using a fan um, or really bright hot sunlight, then you might want to make sure you just do one layer at a time to avoid mold. But I've never really had a problem with mold and I, I live in a humid climate in Virginia. Um, but I highly recommend, no matter how many layers you do, when you're done with it, when it's soaking wet with this stuff, paper mache, paste, and newspaper, I recommend taking a small fan and or anywhere you have moving air and putting it there so that it can really get drying quickly. Okay, that's my recommendation. Yeah, oh. Can we also make really big sculptures using the same technique? Do they hold well? You can make large sculptures, but I wouldn't use foil. I feel like, um, you know, it would just get too expensive. You, you have to buy a bunch of foil to make a large sculpture. I use crumpled paper a lot of times. So like you could take newspaper 
and crumple it and tape it the same way we did with this. However, the only difference is, you know, with shaping foil, you can kind of shape it and it stays. But with paper, you kind of have to shape it and then tape it to make it stay. Does that make sense? Like you have to use the tape as a sculpting tool to make it stay in the shape you want. And then again, I do the same thing if I use if I use crumpled paper, I'll just make make it in pieces. So components as I go along. So I don't think foil is great for really large sculptures. I think cardboard and crumpled paper, those are the best ways. But yes, you can sculpt them the same way. There's so many things. I feel like I, we're only just scratching the surface today of how to make paper mache things because there's lots of things. You can make flat things, you can make small things, you can make really big things, you can make kind of random things. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I probably can't answer every single question today, but hopefully you're getting a little bit of information on the wacky world. Okay, how do I cover the curves and corners so smoothly? Well, I hate to say it, but it's just practice really a lot of practice. Um, using smaller pieces of paper is helpful or thin strips or, yeah, you just have to go very carefully and slowly and also just learn as you go. Like sometimes you go over a little thing like this and it's like you have to kind of fold it over and then put overlap pieces until it looks smooth again. So sometimes you start out, that's another reason to do more than one layer, is you start out, like maybe you cover this, and you kind of did a little bit of bad job on covering the curves and corners. But once you start adding more layers, it somehow starts to smooth over those things and make it look better. So it's just practice and learning how the paper and the paste work on your armature. Sorry that's not too... I don't know, detailed, but there you go. What is the biggest piece I've done in the smaller? Okay, the smallest piece, gosh, it's probably about this big. We're pretty small. Um, and the largest is I, did a cr I made a crazy giant head that I can wear. Um, and it's pretty big. I mean, it goes over my head, but it's also a giant head. And I don't think I have it close by. Nope, I don't. But I would put it on if I did. <laughs> um, I'll put it in my Instagram when I'm done. And then you can see me in my giant head. Yeah. Little stuff is harder than big stuff. Okay, how can I fix a part that has been cracked or broken? Okay, this is true if it has not been painted yet or if it has already been painted. Because I've had things... Um, maybe like a child has been playing with it, even though they're not really toys, they are fun to play with. Um, sometimes, you know, you're looking at it and there's just a big crunch in there. Um, all you have to do is just paper mache over wherever you have a crack or a break, you know, or fix whatever has been broken. So like, you know, if the bun came off, I would probably hot glue the bun back on and then paper mache over it again. So, you know, that's pretty much it. You can do it pretty seamlessly. You, you do have to repaint, that's the only thing. If it's been painted, you'll have to repaint after you fix it, but it's pretty forgiving. Like anytime something breaks or cracks, you can just add a little bit more paper mache and you'll be good to go, okay? But the paint part, that's the bummer, is that sometimes you have to repaint. And if you really like how you painted it the first time, it can be a challenge to get it the same after that. Yeah. So what do we think? Any more questions? How do I get inspiration? Oh, I like that question. Um, well, this, this little cat right here is inspired by my cat, Roger. Now, Roger only has three legs, so this isn't quite, quite accurate, but he's a little orange cat. And I guess nature, I love to make birds. Those are really fun for me. And I, I like to take, this is a bird that's in my yard a lot. It's a robin. And I love seeing them hop around and eat worms. So I have made a bunch of robins that have been fun. I like how goofy they are. 
Um, what else? So nature from books and stories. I have to say just from my imagination. <laughs> Maybe I have an active imagination, but um, yeah, from my imagination. And sometimes when it comes to small things like this, I think I said early on that I don't always plan these out. So sometimes the inspiration comes from just moving my hands with, with the materials and just kind of starting to crumple without a plan in advance and seeing what happens. And if I'm like, oh, that looks like it could be, you know, you might have seen it early on. Yeah, I wasn't sure what I was making, but it turned into a little bee because that's kind of what I saw in the crumpled, crumpled foil. Would I cover the bumblebee stick legs in paper or just paint the wood? That's a great question. And um, it's, you can do either. I've done, I have done either. So I think this one right here, I paper mache her legs. They are sticks, but there's also paper mache covering them. And then sometimes I just paint the sticks. So I just painted her stick legs with stripes. Doesn't matter, it's whatever look you like, or maybe you've covered all of this and you're like, there's just no way I have the patience to do the sticks. Well, you don't really need to, so it's up to you. Covering sticks can be a little bit challenging because um, it just kind of slides around. So if you do that and you don't like it, then don't, then don't do that the next time. So I know. So there's a lot of personal choice in paper mache, but that's what I like about it. You can do whatever you want. So yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I've used cardboard boxes, styrofoam, lots of crumpled newspaper to make larger sculptures. Yes, Debbie, that's right. Cardboard boxes, styrofoam. Sometimes you get these big chunks of styrofoam packing material, and you can use that for your for like the beginning of your armature base. Um, sometimes you find bottles, uh, like in your recycling, that it inspire you, like my pencil cup. Um, this was a pomegranate, you know, that pomegranate palm juice. It kind of goes bloop, bloop. Well, I really liked how round it was, and I wanted to use that. So that inspired me, and I just added stuff to it with crumpled. This is foil, that's foil, like that. So, yeah, you can just do whatever you want try it out. I know that's really too much freedom sometimes for folks, but with paper mache, it really is a lot of freedom because there's no hard and fast rules. Sorry, just jiggling my table all over the place. Um, but, you know, one thing that I want to say is that it's hard sometimes when you're making it to, um, to see it, but it can be very simple. And then when you paint it is when it kind of pops into life. Do I ever glue fabric to my creatures? I have done that before in the past, just a little bit. Um, I don't always, but it's definitely something you can do. I mean, you could make anything and add fabric, clothes, especially if you like to, if you have a lot of fabric, you can definitely do that. You can add yarn for hair or anything. I mean, these are just like little paper crunchy paper dolls that you can do anything to. So that's another great thing about paper mache is if you're a mixed media artist and you have a lot of media, you can use it on your paper mache, which I like a lot. I keep mine pretty simple, but I just really like to paint. So that's why, that's why I don't use fabric, but you can. Yeah. All right. So I think that's it. I mean, I feel like I've gone over a lot of things, kind of like a little crash course in paper mache. Um, there's lots of resources online. There's my Domestica course, which I really recommend. Um, I talk you through like my idea generating process and I have a lot of resources for um, stimulating your imagination and um, Anyways, like everything, pick, picking color palette, picking a color palette, and making your design and shapes. And I have a great Pinterest board you can use as a resource. So I highly recommend taking my class. It's, it's pretty fun, and um, this is a really nice little addition to it because you can kind of learn how to make more dimensional stuff. And also, there's my book. You can find it anywhere. It's, it's called Art Maker's Paper Mache. And my name is Sarah Hand, so you can just look me up that way. 
Um, also my Instagram, I have a lot of uh, stuff on my Instagram that is paper mache related. And in my Instagram TV, I have a little three part thing that I saved. It was a live thing where we made birds. So it's a little variation on what I've taught you today, but very similar. And we go through the paper mache process. So if you don't know how to do that, I think it's the second video we go through the paper mache process. So there's a lot of information out there. And um, yeah, I just urge you to get these basic information, the basic information, and then sort of try your hand at making something. So anything that calls to you um, with your in your recycling, like a bottle or something, maybe that could be that could be the body of something instead of crumpled foil, and then you can make a foil head. Anything you can tape together and then cover with paper mache is totally great. I mean, just whatever you want to do is is good. Freedom, yes, is good. Embrace it. <laughs> So let's see, I really hope to hear from you and I hope to see, hope, there's always somebody who's really fast at making things after they've taken a class or seen a demonstration. So I'm hoping you tag me. I'll put it in my stories if you make a little cute something. Um, and if you have any questions for me, you can, you can always ask me on Instagram or whatever, you know. I'm happy to answer. I, I love teaching paper mache. I just finished a whole week of teaching paper mache summer camp to kids, nine to 11, those were the ages, and they made giant paper mache sculptures. So they're making really big stuff. Um, we had a cat, we had a dog, we had a giant skull like this big. So that's fun for me and I love to answer questions and help people, so I'm open to that. Yeah, thank you. Esto es lo que yo les voy a enseñar hoy día. I'll be showing you guys how to finish this mask.